Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Audrey, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I am so excited to welcome you to tonight's event with Adam Nicholson discussing his latest book, Life Between the Tides. He is joined in conversation tonight by Jonathan Slatt. Through good times and bad, Harvard Bookstore will continue to bring authors and their work to our virtual community. Our spring season is in full swing and you don't wanna miss out on our lineup. Make sure to check out our event schedule on harvard.com slash events where you can also sign up for our email newsletter and browse our shelves from home. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question at any time during the talk, go to the Q&A button on your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. If you would like to purchase a copy of Life Between the Tides, there will be a link in the chat where you can purchase. All sales through this link support Harvard Bookstore, so thank you. You will also have the option for closed captioning for this talk. If you would like captions for the event, click the CC button wherever it lives on your screen. Thank you again for tuning in in support of our authors, our incredible booksellers, and our landmark independent bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support, especially now. And as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as we can. Thank you in advance for your patience and your understanding. Now I am thrilled to introduce tonight's speakers. A New York Times bestselling author, Adam Nicholson has won major, many major awards, including the Somerset Magnum Award and the W.H. Heinemann Award. He has worked as a journalist for the Sunday Times, the Sunday Telegraph, the Daily Telegraph, National Geographic Magazine, and Granta. His books include Why Homer Matters and The Seabirds Cry. He is joined tonight by Jonathan Slatt. Jonathan is the Russia and Northeast Asia coordinator for the Wildlife Conservation Society. His work has been featured by the New York Times, The Guardian, the BBC World Service, NPR, Smithsonian Magazine, among others. He is the author of the award-winning Owls of the Eastern Ice. Tonight, they're discussing Life Between the Tides. This book is a literary peek into one of the most overlooked universes, the one just beneath the surface. Under his microscope, we see a prawn's head become a medieval helmet and a group of winkles transform into a Dickinson social scene with mollusks munching on Stilton and glancing at their pocket watches. This book has been a widely reviewed and has been widely reviewed with nothing but praise. The Wall Street Journal called it a book as shimmeringly beautiful as any of his pools. And on that high note of praise, I'm going to turn things over to our speakers. Adam, Jonathan, Singh, thank you so much for being here tonight. We're grateful to have you. The virtual stage is yours. Hello. Jonathan, can you hear me? Yes. Nice to see you. Very nice to see you too. Very nice to see the book behind you there. Very, very elegantly poised. Thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, I guess, um, you know, so when I sat down, what is, what, uh, first of all, thanks very much to Audrey and to the Harvard Bookstore for, for hosting us here. Um, I do think it continues to be extremely important to have these, these Zoom talks as a way to, for authors to, to reach audiences. And if you are interested in this book, please absolutely, uh, please purchase one through, through the Harvard Bookstore if you can. So when I was first asked to do this talk um, uh, with, with you, Adam, um, you know, I, I, I kind of sat down, uh, you know, cracked the spine, got ready to, to, read, to read a book about tidal pools. And, uh, quickly found out that there's much more going on here. Um, and I think uh, early on in the book, you sort of give, uh, give a glimpse that things are gonna get a little more serious beyond just, just tidal pools. We start talking about fractals and, and fractal theory. Um, there's a line I'm gonna read here that is, uh, fractal theory suggests that the closer you look at something, the more it remains unknown. Knowledge cannot embrace whatever it seeks to know. It can only sit alongside the world contingent, touching it maybe at one or two points, but shrinking beside the unaddressable and limitless actuality of things. And that kind of, I, I felt like that's where I was you know, thrown into this, this much larger story than what I was expecting. Um, you know, yes, there are all these lovely observations of natural history, but this quickly expands to include you know, biographies of, of, of key naturalists and, 
how philosophy helps explain the you know, human relationships and uh, feelings of, uh, toward the tide and the frankly bleak history of, uh, of um, uh, humans in Scotland living alongside its shores. So um, I think if, you know, before we get into some questions, I'd, I'd love it if you could uh, read a passage of the book that you feel is um, representative. Yeah, sure. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing this. I am a major, major fan of yours. I think Owls of the Eastern Ice is really one of the great books about our relationship to nature or to, to the world, really. And it, your book is like, I was thinking, it's, it's like the absolute polar opposite of mine. It's in a vast, epic landscape with these kind of very few, very rare, huge creatures that are, to, for half the book, almost impossible to find. And then when you find them, it, very difficult to catch. And when you've caught them, very difficult to know. And the book is only the kind of beginning of your entire life, it seems to me, <laughs> which you've dedicated to things. So whereas the rock pool is clearly about uh, ordinariness, you know, the creatures that I discuss in, in the book are the ones that literally any one of us can find. And for a long time in my mind, the book was called All the Usual Beauty. And it's all the absolutely usual beauty. But if I just, if I, perhaps if I read the very beginning of it, it kind of sets out what the, what the thing is, is about. So, the sea is not made of water. Creatures are its genes. Look down as you crouch over the shallows, and you'll find a periwinkle or a prawn, a claw displaying crab, or a cluster of anemones ready to meet you. No need for binoculars or special stalking skills. Go to the rocks and the living will say hello. In the 1850s, when Victorian Britain fell in love with the seaside, the Victorian world, one could say, the rock pool became the heart of a kind of nature worship, which saw in its riches and calm a reassuring vision of creation. Life in what Philip Henry Goss, the great apostle of the pools, called these unruffled wells, was a gathering of goodness and even happiness. It was as if the pools came from a time before the fall, when life was innocent and unthreatened. Goss, surely half remembering the children's rhyme, imagined Adam and Eve stepping lightly down to bathe in the rainbow-coloured spray. At just the moment, Darwin was challenging the God-ordained vision of nature and setting the whole of life adrift on chance-driven change. The rock pools looked to those Victorians like gardens of prelapsarian bliss, glimmering enclosures in which nature seemed to have enshrined perfection and permanence. We've inherited some of that Victorian longing for calm, we still go to the seaside for consolation and simplicity. Demands and anxieties seem to drop away there. Things still are as they were when we were 10. The rock pools still beckon, the blennies and gobies still shimmer beneath us. But there are ironies in choosing the shore as a theatre for reassurance. Even if its changes are dependable and rhythmic, it is thick with variability. A tidal coast is filled with that paradoxical quality, reliable unreliability, both closed and open-ended, both familiar and strange. Regularity toys with uncertainty there. Nothing is more predictable than the coming and going of the tide, and yet nothing about it can be relied on. Daily revelation and daily erasure, daily loss and daily reacquisition. This book is about those multiple layers between the tides, the ways in which the simple overlies the less than simple there, the extraordinary mirroring of human and animal life on its shores, in pools that are silent and beautiful and as full of threat as any rat's alley. The intertidal is rich but troubled. There's no coincidence, it's one of the most revelatory habitats on Earth. Of all the great discoveries made in the science of nature, 
from a grasp of taxonomy to the sequence of creatures through time revealed in the rocks, the adaptations of organisms to circumstance, the idea of natural selection and the working of ecological webs. All these ways of understanding the pattern of life first emerged from studying what was happening to animals and plants between the tides. It is where you can look beyond your own reflection and find the marvelous an inch beneath your nose. The soul wants to be wet, Heraclitus wrote in Ephesus two and a half thousand years ago. And that is the impulse this book follows. <laughs> I think when I, when I think of this book in relation to yours, you know, I, I first started writing books 40, 42 years ago, I think. My first book was published. And, and this book, in a way, comes at the end of a long sequence of writing about things. Whereas your book has the, this sort of, sort of raging vigour of the 28-year-old. <laughs> vodka fueled or ethanol fueled amazingly ethanol were you really drinking ethanol uh and uh so i just i they are slightly at the either either end of the way one might approach the natural that you are in, embedded incredibly singular the young man obsessed and i am now mid-60s finding myself reflecting about things it's really this is a terrible pun that this is a kind of pool, tide pools are, are very reflective places. They're not sort of uh, ferociously engaged in the way that uh, your uh, pursuit of the owls uh, was and is maybe, but they do let you kind of um, consider what it is to be alive, not to put too fine a point on it. And that, in a way, I think is what this book is about. It's what is it to be? I mean, it seems, sounds crazy to want to uh, embrace that, but I think that is what it's about. So I think you know, central to the book was, was a decision that you made to create at least maybe one at the, at the start, while well, you end up creating three title pools. And so what, what drove you to, to do that? Well, there's, a, there's this bay that uh, my wife's family has been going to for almost a century now, and they have a house on this bay on the west coast of Scotland, and it's full of marvels, very, very beautiful place with waterfalls and there's a ruined castle and lighthouse. It's sort of like it's a dream a, a dream bit of Scotland. Um, but the geology means that there are no pools there. It's largely basalt with bits of uh, limestone, Jurassic limestone, and neither of them make pools. And so I longed to have a pool because a pool is a place where you can kind of cup the ocean. You can make a make a, a micro ocean in that fractal way, where the whatever whatever the sea has or whatever the shore has can be held in a sort of soup bowl. And so I thought, first of all, I would dig one. So I, I dug one with um, pickaxes and uh, kind of wrecking bars and all the rest of it but that what didn't work very well because it was right at the head of the bay and what I hadn't quite grasped at the beginning is that you need a quite a dynamic environment around a pool for the life in it to become very various and so then I made another by making a little dam which blocked off a, a kind of hollow which the tide could come into and, and be, be held there and so on. And then finally, I, I built one right out on the far point, which was a wild environment thrashed by the sea. And that, uh, that was the most exciting of all, really. Because the whole thing, someone said to me, I love this word, that someone said to me when I was halfway through doing it, saying, this is an exercise in bioreceptivity. 
And uh, I just love like opening a bar for uh, marine life. It's like, you know, that instinct that so many of us have say, well, opening a cafe or open this and come in, let's see what happens. And it was that it was a kind of it was an invitation to life. And that I thought also, if you make something raw of rock only, so it is kind of naked, it's like the pl naked planet before life you can actually see the, the accumulation and the coming in and the complexifying of the system uh, as it arrives, rather than sort of, you know, if I, if I think of you in the far east of Russia, you know, you, you arrive at this extraordinarily evolved and ecosystem that is in the process of being damaged, you know? And so in a way it's the other end. It's, an, it's about beginnings. You know the kind of loveliness of beginnings that's what it was really yeah. if that makes yeah. sense it does and at, at <laughs> what point in this process did you decide that this would be your next book project oh i think i first thought of doing it when i had small children and they're all now you know corporate lawyers age 35 <laughs> so uh, it's been in my mind a long time i don't know if this is true of you but I have kind of ideas that swirl about in my mind for decades before they then emerge as, as, a, as, a, as a book. And so I, I, had a, I had various forms in mind. I thought I would build one high up the shore and pump water in and then I, and, mm. and so on and so forth. But this, this you know, I, I hacked along. I had great fun doing it. It was slightly like a boy playing in, in a stream, you know, you know that pleasure. Sure. Like you with your traps, yeah, your owl traps. That was fun, wasn't it? Doing that. It was fun. Yeah. <laughs> it um, was more intense than fun, maybe. It, but yeah, I guess it was a, it was a combination of the two. Um, but so, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, the fir first bit I I uh, I talked about um, t uh, this evening, uh, where it's not just about the pool. Like you quickly start talking about um, you know the influence of or. or, or how uh, tides have influenced authors. Um, you, you talk about you know, philosophers. You talk about history. At what did you did you know going in that this would not just be a book of your your observations of of the pools? No, I didn't actually. Um, I thought to start with it should just be about a sequence of uh, creatures. Mm -hmm. I had written a book about seabirds um a few years ago uh and had hacked around the world becoming rather obsessed with them and had written that just to every chapter about a different seabird and i thought you know you could very easily do that with uh, and in a way this book begins like that too it talks about yeah. prawns and, and, and winkles and crabs and anemones and so on but of course the it's the grandest of metaphors the tide because, well, in lots of different ways, but it's kind of, it's rhythmic coming and going, it's, it's deep connection to the, the patterns of the universe, really, to the kind of realities of gravity, to the planetary realities. Uh, and philosophically, or maybe poetically, um, the idea that, uh, it is in a way very closely connected to the fractal idea that the uh, the phenomenon of of the world or the phenomenon of existence is not actually blocky. It isn't actually solidly present in the way that a sort of conventional materialist would think it were were. It is actually something where, as you said at the very beginning, you know, the, the scale of something relies on the length of the ruler you use to measure it. And the smaller the ruler, the larger the thing. And the longer the time you give, the more time you have, mysteriously. It's, uh, and it's not a sort of uh, weird new agey thing to say that. It is actually a physical reality. And so that if you, if you do spend your time, as I did, gazing at the increasingly small, 
you do start to think about uh, how does my life connect with theirs? How, how am I and a prawn like each other? And the science that people have done on, for example, the, the psychology of the prawn is really astonishing. But, you know, there's one thing, there's a very marvelous uh, professor in Bordeaux called um, Professor Fossa. And uh, he wanted to know about whether a, a prawn could feel anxious or crayfish, I think it actually was. I don't know if you read this section. Yeah. And so, because usually if you put a, uh, if you put a, a, um, a crustacean like that into a maze, into an underwater maze, it'll very happily um, walk into any part of the maze, whether it's lit or dark, it isn't frightened. And so he got a selection of, of crayfish in his laboratory and some he didn't do anything to and they indeed wandered around the maze every part they could find. Some he shocked with a mild electric shock. Science is cruel, you know that Jonathan, I think science is cruel. And when he had uh, shocked them, after the shock, not while the shock was being applied, but after the shock, he put them in the maze and they would not go into the well-lit areas. They hid in the dark. And then as a third group, he shocked and then he gave them an anti-anxiety drug, benzodiazepine, which many people are familiar with, benzo. And having been, had the shock and then the drug, then they returned to absolutely normal, curious behavior. So what does it say? It says that those shocked prawns, they had no, nothing to make them frightened where they were. There was nothing actually frightening them, but they could imagine threat and they could remember threat. And so a prawn has both a sense of past and future and an imagination. A prawn can imagine a situation that is not like the one it's currently in. In other words, prawns dream. Well, you don't think that when you're having the sandwich, do you? Oh, I don't anyway. <laughs> and, uh, I Watching prawns, I mean, they're, I'd never really engaged with prawns before, but they're incredibly touching things. You know, they have these little cells, statocysts uh, on their body, which have fine little hairs with grains of sand and and if they are tipped one way or another uh, they know that they're that they're tipped because the grains of sand uh, lie more heavily on hairs on this side than on this side and so they they rebalance themselves so quite often in the uh, rock pool when I was looking at the prawns there would be prawns which weren't quite right They'd be swimming. Can you say anything? They'd be swimming along like this. In other words, partially disabled prawns, who were nevertheless hacking it in yeah. off the west coast of Scotland. And one, can, I cannot help but feel incredibly close to that little creature, from which I am separated by 700 million years of evolution. What does that say about consciousness? You know, what, what does that tell you about uh, the nature of, of living things? I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I sounds crazy and vain to say this, but I honestly think my life was changed by seeing these things, that my attitude to, to other people, to other things, is different. I still have prawn sandwiches, but I justify that in thinking that if the prawn found me in a sandwich, would it eat me? And it certainly would. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, say, say what you think about this, Jonathan, about your owls and their consciousness. I'd be really interested to hear that because you don't talk about that a great deal, as far as I, I've gathered in your book. Right. What is an owl's consciousness? Yeah, I mean, one thing that struck me reading reading your book was how uh, what I did in Owls of the Eastern Nights is 
really surface level stuff. It's a lot of reaction to, you know, blizzards and, and floods and things. And it's, you're right. I, I, I don't go very deep below that surface of, of, of the immediacy of, of, of the situation. Whereas but, where, I where the, thought when reading it, but you have days in which you're stuck in remote sheds doing yeah. nothing. What yeah. you must, something must be going on in your mind. Yeah. You must and yeah, be like thinking a, about this. Yeah, I, I, I don't have a, a great sense of, of owl consciousness. I, I, I believe, you know, these, the, the fish owls anyway, they, they move very little. Uh, they live in a place where the landscape is harsh. And I think they find a place that's safe, that meets their basic needs of yeah. like food and shelter and just hunker down. So um, one thing, especially part one of your book, which has these, uh, each chapter is is a species. And we start with what the, the, the sand hoppers, if that's right, then the prawns and the winkles and the crabs, if I haven't missed any. Um, and it's, it's filled with just these wonderful anecdotes. Uh, and one thing that really uh, captured my attention uh, um, was with in the crab chapter, the, the pre-copulatory embrace. Can you yeah. can you describe that? <laughs> Yes, the pre, there's a sort of, when I give talks about this, there's a sort of terrible, awkward shuffling in the audience when I, when I mention that, <laughs> that, uh, that phrase. Well, the uh, thing about uh, crabs, I think it's probably true of all crabs, but the particular crab, uh, crab I'm, I'm discussing is very common uh, European crab, called the, Europe, the green shore crab, which is in fact also now a pest in, in uh, North America and other parts of the world. It's so aggressive, it's incredibly aggressive, dominant creature in its uh, shore environment. And the French call it the crab enragé because it holds up its uh, claws when you approach it. And the, uh, of course, one's notion of a crab life is that it's um, um, you know, brutal and simple. But because of the uh, carapace, the hard outer shell, a crab can only have sex when it's soft. And so the big male crabs, in order to uh, make sure that they um, control their mates, find a female and hold her underneath uh, her leg like this. I don't know, you can't see that, no, but underneath her leg, his leg, uh, in, or in order to wait for her to become soft <clears throat> so they can then copulate. And so the, uh, the male holds very tenderly the female and um, you can't see, I should stand up like that. It kind of it doesn't really work on this. <laughs> uh, and uh, and then when she's soft, then they turn over. And do you know that when you eat, you, you eat a crab, there's that flap that you 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 open in order to get access to the to meat. They both open their flaps and then they copulate. And so and then in some crabs, there is a post copulatory embrace as well. And. This usually works very well, but there's one terrifying experiment done, in fact, by an American in Florida, I think, where he put a um, molting female crab in a, in a small aquarium with a male. And the molting crab uh, indeed shed her hard carapace and approached the uh, male crab and started to stroke him with her thing, with her claw. But the male crab, instead of understanding what this was, ate the soft claw with which she was stroking him. And the, the scientist said, well, this is just a, uh, clearly the poor male crab was rather inexperienced and didn't realize what the signals being given, given to him were. Uh, but so, I mean, I'm, I'm interested to know about what the fish owls do in, in, in terms of pair bonding. You know, could, do they show tenderness towards each other? Well, I mean, I think in the, in the same way that, that, uh, that, that many um, 
raptors do, which is not that much. I mean, not that the, much. It's no. a very, you know, it's the. Uh, it's the, pretty cursory. Pretty cursory. It's the, you know, the, the copulation is the cloacal kiss, where essentially the female will sit somewhere and make yeah. noise and the male flies over and awkwardly flaps on her back for a, for a brief, the briefest of moments. Yes. And then that's, and then that's it. Um, but it's but it's they, seen that. So it may be that actually having a hard shell necessitates longer a relationship yeah right yeah so which you could there are there are human analogies here aren't there yeah. you know it's because we're so defended against each other in so many ways that actually love only happens well if you know you can spend some time i mean that's, I, 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 I will say this, this is the whole thing about people are worried about talking about animals anthropomorphically you know just yeah. uh, imputing to them these uh, human characteristics yeah. but um it's it's just as useful i think to think of them think of it as a sort of version of, of zoomorphism to understand the animal aspects of our our natures right. and to understand to draw draw the, the metaphor the other way I think that's a lot of what this book is about too. Yeah. And there are quite a number of um, brief biographies of sort of you know, key figures in, um, in the study of some of the species that live in these pools. And one character I found especially sympathetic was uh, John Vaughn Thompson. Yes. Um, can, you, can you briefly describe who he was, what he studied and-, and Yes, he was, a, he was a minor government official um, a, a doctor living in the south of Ireland in Cork uh, in the early 19th century and not a member of the kind of grand London mm. establishment and not a member of the great clubs, the Linnaean Society and all that in London, sort of who were, became the great sponsors of Darwin and all the rest of them. And uh, but fascinated by uh, natural history and he was one of the very first people to trawl with a plankton net. And uh, he trawled up and down the big harbour at Cork, on the cove there. And uh, in his plankton net found these, uh, these little creatures that weren't recognisably part of uh, any, any, anything, any kind of uh, species or genus that he knew and so they were called they'd been already named by some German and French scientists the zoe meaning just simply the 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 zoe the the living things it's all just the animal just life things and he marvelously kept some of these alive in his aquarium by changing the water very regularly carefully and found that from these zoe emerged tiny crabs and they so that Zoe turned turned out to be the planktonic stages of of crabs, and um, he published these findings himself uh, in kind of self self uh, produced pamphlets, and utterly disparaged by the London establishment and told it was absolute nonsense and people couldn't reproduce what he'd done and he was just making it up some kind of weird um you know eccentric in the south of Ireland and eventually he went off to Australia and worked there as a sort of on a terrible terrible job working as a as a um medical officer in the um, penal colony in Australia and died young and his grave is even lost now. And only later, when uh, Darwin, among others, discovered or kind of rediscovered that he had made these great discoveries, um, uh, was he kind of given any standing. He's a sort of, uh, he's a very sympathetic figure because uh, when I found out about him and, and started reading all his things, he, I felt he was not unlike me poking around in my little rock pool, trying to find out kind of one or two things about, well, nothing as kind of world shaking as that. But the whole science of uh, the planktonic stages of crabs that he invented really, that all began is astonishing that 
it now seems that the even the eggs that a crab lays in the on in the intertidal are themselves aware of the state of the tide that uh, if uh, an egg lying on the bottom of a rock pool feels that the tide has come in in other words that there is a greater pressure of hydrostatic pressure on the egg from above then it will know that it, the time has come for it to float up into the upper surface of the water because if there's a lot of tide in then the tide will begin to ebb and on the ebb the eggs and these tiny first initial larval planktonic stages of the crab get get washed out to sea and it's much safer to grow out at sea and so larval crabs can spend you know, extraordinary amount of time but like i think it's something like 40 days out at sea and a long way out at sea drifted out there by the tides but then they reach a stage just before they become a true crab a stage called a, a megalops when they have huge eyes big eyes when this sense this understanding of uh if the tide is ebbing you should be in the upper surface uh they then come to understand that if the tide is flooding coming back in towards the shore that uh, they should go in uh, go into the upper surface of the waters and so it's an extraordinarily uh, adapted system that a, an animal knows to use the tide to leave to grow and to be brought back in yeah. where it can then thrive on the shore and, you know, and actually dominate these uh, intertidal zones all, all around the the temperate world now and it's just you know i i feel kind of gobsmacked by this delicacy you don't you i mean i just think we treat we don't treat the world in a way that understand or the natural world in a way that understands that sensitivity yeah. you know we don't think of crabs as knowing that much do we you know yeah and also you know it grimly <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, i think a really important point that, that, you, that you make in the book is about the how the systems that the tidal systems rely on chaos and con not necessarily chaos but a, a regular catastrophe and mm. when there when there are disruptions to that you know i i go i go to a show well, prior to reading your book i go to the shore and like you mentioned you see the same thing that you saw since you were 10 not recognizing the frequent upheavals and the changes going on there that the system is, is adapted for and when something comes in and removes the predator, the top predator, or there's an oil spill and uh, the, 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 the plants are removed, it, 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 it ruins everything. And you lead to these, uh, these boom bust cycles that you mentioned, I think with limpets uh, and how it throw, throws it all off balance. And then you, I think you do a nice job of, of tying that, that regular catastrophe in with, with the Scots, the, the, the Celts, I believe, who are li living along the, the shores and how there was just this regular cycle of, I think there's a wonderful line about, well, not wonderful, but a, a, a well, an eloquent line about uh, the regularity with which um, famines uh, were just part of the daily, uh, of, of life in, uh, in these coastal areas of Scotland. Yes, I think there's a, there's a very good, there's a very good uh, line by the, um, the pre-Socratic philosopher that, by, by Heraclitus, say, which says, boiled down, that strife is justice. And that only if things are in tension with each other can there be a kind of a rich and abundant sense of community. It's the most counterintuitive idea that actually tyranny is singular calm and multiple vitality is strife, is sort of frozen strife. 
And that is, de is definitely the lesson of the intertidal, the, the lesson maybe of, a, of any ecology, of, a, of any environment, that only if you have, uh, you know, multiple demands in play, will you get actually a, a rich uh, biology there that as soon as as soon as you allow one thing to die if you allow um grazers to dominate or yeah. or you or you have you know in in this sense as well a uh, pollution pollution is is a form of tyranny that a, that a, that a pollution incident is like a tyrant coming and denying the multiple validity of the system over which he or she then presides. And so I think this is, this is extremely difficult to grasp intuitively because we want to think that when you see multiple calm in a, in a tidal pool, when you see the sort of the exquisite beauty and the co-presence of all these things, you want to see that as a sort of beautiful communitarian tea party, don't you? But, a, but actually, it even in extraordinary, I was amazed when I found this out that even among seaweeds, seaweeds poison each other. You know, that even the plant life that are in these places is in a state of endless tension. And as you say, there was a famous incident in uh, the southwest of England in the 1960s when a large uh, oil uh, tanker uh, broke up and, and polluted uh, a lot of the, the beaches and shore of, of Cornwall and, and Devon and then was treated with extremely uh, toxic uh, surfactants to try and break it up. And... The whole of the Southwest, or in certain certain parts more worse than others, but but really the whole of the Southwest of England, uh, the limpets uh, were killed by this uh, double oil and then surfactant. And as the limpets died, then there was an utter explosion of the seaweeds on which they uh, graze, and uh, the seaweeds then. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember what happened then. Then I think there's a whole series of things that, oh, that's right. It then goes into an extreme uh, wobbly thing where you have an absolute explosion of limpets and, uh, and they all die, and then an absolute explosion of seaweed. And the thing is in a kind of anarchic, chaotic, sort of, uh, you know, politically, you could say, sort of uh, oligarchic, uh, anarchic uh, alternation like that. And so, um, I like the idea that strife, sort of fixed strife, is justice. Maybe yeah. that's what the good society is too. That actually that we are, you know, if you sell a book, I won't damn your eyes. You know, or if I sell a book, you won't. But that is how we are. That is what, that's how we live in with each other. Yeah. So in a, uh, just a few moments, we'll, we'll take some questions from the audience, but I, I can't uh, uh, end this without uh, this. Uh, I learned so much in this book, and one of my favorite bits of, of, of trivia, you, know, you, might, you might say, was how uh, tides are actually changing the length of the day. Isn't that can, can, you, can you talk about that? Well, I can't. I, can. I mean, one of the problems with writing a book, I mean, I wrote it kind of two years ago. Well, I can't remember everything in it. But the thing about, yes, obviously, the time... Okay, so go back to, to basics. The tides are created, as everyone knows, by the pull of the moon on the earth. So the moon pulling this envelope of, of uh, water out beyond the rocky earth. And so the height of the tides is created by the moon, but the actual movement of the tides is created by the earth turning within that watery envelope. So when you see a tide roaring past a headland, it's not actually the water that's moving in space. It's the headland that's moving through the water. And so the water, this watery envelope, 
remains virtually still, not quite because the moon moved, but virtually still in space. And the rocky earth is rotating inside its little uh, egg of water. And of course, there is friction involved in that. That is the, 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 rub, the water rubs up against the earth. And so the tides every day are slowing the earth down. And I can't remember the actual figures, but when, when are we actually going to come to a stop? I think someone has calculated when the earth will actually stop turning because the, the oceans have stopped it turning. And then we'll just live in this endless still pool. Yeah. It'd be a tragic moment. <laughs> okay. I, I don't remember. Who do that, you remember? You remember it's it's like milli, milliseconds every century or something. A millisecond every century. Yeah. So you've got we'll somewhere be, we'll to go. Fine. Somewhere to go. So you know, there are more urgent issues. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay uh, I'm going to switch to transition to some questions from the audience uh, and see if we have any. Good ones here. Uh, so uh, first question is from an anonymous attendee. Um, <laughs> right. Have you seen the documentary, My Octopus Teacher? Do you, have any, do you have any response to what is presented in that film based on your own experience? It's an absolutely beautiful and very touching film. Like all films, it, uh, I've made some television films. I say, I know it's sort of not entirely true. Uh, and I don't know how many octopuses are actually involved in that film. And so there's, there is a part of me which is irritated by its, um, by its sort of, by there's an element of sentimentality, I think, in it. That is, there is this one octopus that is, a, you know, a lovely thing and he makes friends with it and then it suffers and, and dies. And, and I'm, I feel pretty sure there are multiple octopuses involved in that film. And the more, I mean, I, I hate to be disparaging about it, but the more beautiful take on this kind of close shore life is exactly the one you were just talking about, that actually the beauty of it is in its systematic nature, not in its falsely biographized nature. Mm. Yeah. That's what I would say. Okay. Um, Another question from anonymous attendee. Um, if a prawn dreams, can all animals dream? And if so, did they develop those abilities the same way as mammals did, or did dreaming develop independently? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I mean, there is a very, you know, I think everything that's happened to us all over the last two years with this virus does kind of indicate that uh, intentionality, well, I don't know about intention, but maybe mind may well be indistinguishable from life. That maybe life is actually another word for mind. Uh, even if, you know, it's difficult for a virus to express itself in whatever way or and so there is no, you know, that I know that if you, if you put bacteria in the presence of a sugar solution, the bacteria will move towards the sugar. And that it is extremely difficult to find a horizon at which mind appears in life. That if you can accept that in the crustacea, just recently the government in this country have made crustacea subject to the same uh, animal rights uh, uh, legislation as uh, high, higher beings. It's, it's very, very difficult to find a moment at, at which you can say that is conscious and that is not. And I think it is a perfectly good starting position to say that, that everything alive is mind in some ways or other. That 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 it, and also it's an extremely fruitful way to to think of the living world that it is actually mind in action. Nature is mind in action. Yeah. Yeah. Great. <laughs> okay. Uh, here's one from Lauren Roberts. Adam, can you tell us about the illustrations in the book? 
and what your collaboration with the artist was like. Yes, well, there are some, there are quite a few photographs in the book, and there are also the paintings by a great friend of mine, Kate Boxer, who, and she uh, did the pictures of the seabirds when I wrote the book about seabirds, and so. Mm -hmm. We came, uh, she came to the rock pools with me and I, I, I made a small aquarium in, in the house there and we spent a lot of time just uh, looking very closely at these things together. And then she made these wonderful, wonderful drawings. This is an absolutely lovely shrimp she made. I don't, have you got them there? I do, I've got that. Uh, you oh, can yeah, yes, yeah, so like that. It's quite difficult to see on this screen, yeah. but it's uh, they are uh, f full of a kind of um, sensibility uh, of the of them being more than you know the contents of a sandwich. Yeah. Uh, and uh, no, she's she's a wonderful person, and um, it was it's a treat to to work with an artist like you know writing books as we all know, can be a lonely old business. And it's very, very nice to have a uh, c collaborator along, along with you. Yeah. yeah, there really are qu quite a number of, of photographs and illustrations in, in the book that really, really do add to it. You, know, you have these, the art that you're just mentioning, plus photographs of, of the pools being built and uh, uh, animals living inside the pools. Um, then the also- The battle of the anemones, that's the one I like best. Yeah, the yeah. battle that when I, I I brought some sea anemones and put them in my aquarium, not realizing that they were from two different clones, <laughs> and they had this terrifying fight. I wonder if I can show you that. But you'd never think yeah. you see these things yeah. nailing each other, yeah. and uh, because one well, had a blue foot and one had a red foot, and. Uh, it was just, it was honestly like a kind of Netflix evening when I was watching this going on. Now, when, when you say nailing each other, do you, like, what, what, what's, at what speed are these, these fellows whacking each other? It's very slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's very slow. The, that page, that page of their fight, yeah. that's probably as long as we've been talking this evening, I think, yeah, probably. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, well, yeah, it's too, it doesn't really work on this medium, but incredibly this the big the red one uh, beat the blue one and the blue one floated away and then mm -hmm. where the blue one had been sitting the red one replaced it with its own clone yeah they don't they don't uh, have sexual reproduction uh, seeing enemies and so every child of an enemy is identical to the parent what that must be like i don't know <laughs> anyway <laughs> Okay, here's a question from Victor. Uh, McElhinney, I apologize for that. Um, so you mentioned uh, adaptation producing sensitivity to tidal state through pressure with the message to rise high so that the creature can, can, can be swept out to sea. Mm -hmm. Any sense of how long this learning takes, say thousands of generations or far longer? We get vertebrates maybe two billion years after stromalites. Is evolutionary science giving any giving anything like a timetable? I don't think I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. I don't know. Uh, is the straightforward answer? I don't know. Okay, fair enough. I don't know either. Um, then a couple comments from Linda Morrison. The first being that uh, this thinking reminds me uh, when I think you were talking about the the, the, the tyranny. Uh, this thinking reminds me of the principles of the U.S. Constitution. The government comes from the strife among the three branches of government, mm. plus the press, plus constituents. Mm. Um, and then her second comment is, uh, Linda says, my take on the COVID pandemic is that the planet is telling us that there are too many human beings on this earth. Um, any, any reaction to either of those comments? Well, I, th I think it's true about there's a constitution that is uh, founded on a, a kind of conflict of um, institutions is going to be better than a, than a tyranny. I mean, just, yeah. it's going to be more generous to the participants. Yeah. Um, and what was the second one? That there are too many people on earth. Yeah. I feel very wary about that. It's very good in the, I'm very impressed by the, 
your attitude in the uh, Isles of the Eastern Ice, that you understand that the logging and the fishing have to be there to support the people who are living there. And you do not kind of fall for, you know, the misanthropic uh, trap of saying, you know, that, uh, that human beings are the great uh, destro destroyers of the world. Uh, and so, you know, they should be banned. I mean, obviously, we have done terrible damage to uh, the natural world. We all know that now. And one of the purposes of a book like this, and obviously the work that you're doing in the Far East of Russia, is to understand uh, the virtues of accommodation, of mutuality, of, uh, of co-presence. And one of the reasons that I wrote a lot about uh, traditional knowledge in, in, in that part of the world is that there are very, very good models for uh, sort of allowing <clears throat> the animal world a, an absolutely intimate role in our own lives. You know, they are the models are there. And that is surely the kind of humane and optimistic and generous and non-oppressive way to, to go on, you know, to understand that human life can accommodate as long as it is full of understanding. You know, you won't understand unless you know, and you won't know unless you look, and you just got to look long and hard. Yeah. That's what your book is about too, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I showed a book about it. my mind it is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, we're, we're running out of time. We really have uh, two minutes left. Um, I do want to just kind of, uh, before bringing Audrey back, do want to close by just thank you for writing this book. I mean, it's, it's certainly changed how I look at that space between land and sea. And I think you do such a great job of showing, and we didn't really talk about this uh, in this hour, and. Um, the uh what that line means for humans um yeah. where it's this it's it's a scary place uh it's a place of opportunity it's and there's so many things happening there that i hadn't thought about before um and i, oh, that's I, lovely I, to I, hear. I will moving forward so, so thank you thank you thank you so much well it's been an absolute treat to talk to you I'm an honor so thank you yeah my pleasure okay <laughs> thank you so much both of you for being here and giving us this fantastic conversation um i'm just enthralled by how lovely this has been um oh, for everyone who's watching at home thank you for tuning in and showing up for authors publishers any book selling and the incredible staff at harvard bookstore if you would like to purchase a copy of life between the tides there are links that i've posted in the chat check them out please remember to shop indie shop local um you you won't regret it this book has gotten nothing but beautiful reviews i think it's going to be a life-changing book for anyone who reads it. Um, Jonathan, Adam, thank you again. I, I'm really grateful that you were able to give your time. Um, from all of us at Harvard Bookstore, have a great rest of your night. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Audrey. Good night. It was a pleasure, Adam. Great.